So, firstly, thank you for being here. There's some people in the room who remember this place when it was apparently a spirit club. So this is a very uh, appropriate venue to talk about sex robots. Uh, my name is Luke Robert Mason, and firstly, I would like to thank Lights for Soho, who firstly agreed to have an event called Fucking Machines in their <laughs> venue. And secondly, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Bondara, who unbelievably went, sure, why don't we sponsor this event? Bondara.co.uk, who sell, well, I am sure you can imagine, given the, the theme of tonight's event. <laughs> All right. Uh, clearly a customer. So, uh, here I'm Veronica, I didn't know. Uh, so welcome to our very first, but hopefully not our last, uh, Virtual Futures Salon. Uh, and it's the Virtual Futures Salon. The first Virtual Futures Conference occurred at the University of Warwick during the mid-90s. And to quote uh, its co-founder, it arose at a tipping point in the technologization of first world cultures. Whilst uh, it was often portrayed as a techno-positivist -positive, uh, festival of accelerationism towards a post-human future, the Glastonbury of cyberculture, as the Guardian put it. Its actual aim behind the brush steel, the silicon, the jargon, the designer drugs, the charismatic profits, and the techno parties was much more sober and urgent. You see, what Virtual Futures did was it cast a critical eye over the phenomenal changes in how humans and perhaps non-humans uh, engage with emerging scientific theory and technological development. This salon event, and hopefully this salon series, fingers crossed, completes Virtual Futures Conference's aim to bury the 20th century and to begin work on the 21st. So, together, let's begin. We are here to talk about fucking machines in London on a foggy evening on a Tuesday for yet another debate about fucking machines. Another curated discussion underlined by our own human insecurity uh, about versions of us in silica. Fucking anthropomorphic fucking machines. Machines that fuck us. And let's face it, machines are already fucking us, or <laughs> so we seem to be told. Robots will kill us. Robots will take our jobs. Robots will be our salvation. Robots won't understand us. Robots will understand too much about us. Robots will not empathize with us. We will empathize too much with robots. Robots will surpass us. All robots will be too dumb to serve us. Robots will not be us. Robots will be too like us. Robots will learn to be a better version of us. Robots will fuck us. And perhaps we will fuck robots. That's a better kill us. <laughs> there is such a strong reaction to killer robots, so why not sex robots? is exactly the question being asked by the 2015 campaign against sex robots. But this campaign uh, is not simply about identifying where the human might once again become obsolete, and it's not re merely about the redistribution of labor from the 40 million sex workers worldwide to an army of sex robots. This campaign isn't really about preempting another West Coast Silicon Valley mass disruption of the wealth that is generated, and it's $186 billion, in the market that is prostitution, this panel, perhaps, won't be about the uberization of sex. <laughs> of course, if it was, the app would obviously be called Luba. <laughs> you could get a Luba X, <laughs> X, X, and of course there would be a ride-sharing option. <laughs> uh, the campaign against sex robots is about a harder rub, an increasing friction, a point of tension. So let me give you the climax that you want. Sellers of sex are often seen by the buyers of sex as things, not recognized as human subjects. 
sex robots as objects enforce this narrative, which means we have some questions to answer. Are those who engage in human-to-robot sexual relationships interested in sexual engagement with the artifice, with an artificial human, on its own terms? Or do they desire a uh, stimulation with a simulation of human-to-human -human sexual relations? What becomes expected? What becomes coded? And with this codification of sex, will we start to see a datafication of pleasure responses? Are orgasm patterns unique? Are they impossible to duplicate? Is your sexual response the ultimate biometric identifier? Forget fingerprints. Does our biological sexual programming make us helpless during the sex act? Do we find ourselves in that moment just responding to stimuli? Well, doesn't that remind us of a machine? When do persons become things and when do things become persons? How will human-robot relationships change our expectations of human-to-human -human relationships? Do we want to be machines? Do people want to be optimized fucking machines? Once you go tech, is there any going back? So, if you have your WD-40 handy, <laughs> to answer some of those questions and many more are our esteemed panel. And the first panelist I would like to introduce is Ian Pearson. Now, Ian Pearson is a futurologist at uh, Futurizon. And the question, Ian, that I want to ask you, because you really, as a futurologist, you've been at the forefront of seeing how these innovations um, uh, might occur and already are occurring. And I just want you to give us and our audience the kind of lay on the land um, before we start fantasizing about the future of sex robots. And I just want to know what you're already seeing in the, uh, in the terms of the market for VR and sex robots and perhaps AR. I know you were uh, kind of pivotal in writing the research report of our sponsor, Bondara. Bondara, I mentioned that. Uh, so <laughs> I, uh, I wonder if you could share some of those, uh, some of those findings with us. Yeah, I mean, the, the report I wrote for Bondara was very much uh, near term and technology, and it was quite restricted to sex toys and things like that, really. But it's, uh, uh, we're, we're already starting to see the beginnings of VR. People are very aware of what you can do with VR, I think. And we're also becoming aware of what you can do with augmented reality. So I see a view where in the future, not very far away, where you throw away the Oculus Rift really clumsy headset, which really isn't that much better than the ones we were playing with in 1991 and we replace it with active contact lenses. So you could be in bed with one person and you see somebody totally different right in front of you and you don't have to have the big clumsy headset. And you can change who you have sex with every five seconds if you so desire. So you can change the physical appearance of the person you're playing with, but it goes much further. We're already starting to see the beginnings of what I call active skin. That's technology from about 15 years ago, but we're now starting to see the very first prototypes of membranes that you can stick on the skin surface and they've been being designed primarily for medical reasons and sports monitoring and things like that, but actually those same membranes can vibrate. You can put um, polymer gels in them, you can stimulate those and make them contract. That allows you to create a vibrating membrane. Uh, the next generation of that is putting devices right into the skin surface and you can link right through to the nervous system. And instead of your wrist, obviously you can do that in your genitalia. And we will very soon have the internet of genitalia where um, you will be able to stimulate electronically across the net from the cloud, you build a record, uh, an entire sex act, and replay it, and all of the fun and the sensations. But not only your own sensations, eventually that will be the other person's sensations as well. Because the next thing that happens further down the line from that is that we start linking directly into the, the, the brain as well. And again, that's beginning to happen a little bit. We're starting to see the first interfaces happening today. And it won't be very long before you can actually be in the other person's nervous system, feeling how much pleasure you're giving them. And that direct feedback might actually help some of us men to do a better job when we're stimulating our, our partners. And of course, you've now got the more accurate GPS as well, so we can actually find the clitoris. So there are some advantages <laughs> with the, uh, this new technology. But having that direct feedback 
I think, you know, when we look at having sex with a robot, you should assume that that robot has a direct link into your nervous system. It's not just a, you know, a penis with a thruster behind it or a peristaltic sheath. It will actually be able to directly stimulate the nerves inside your body, directly stimulate the nerves inside your head, and to create the sensations that you would have uh, in any kind of sex act. And that means that you can then share that across the cloud. You can have any number of people sharing the same body during that sex act. You can record any aspect of it. You can replay any aspect of it. You can completely customize it. And in the same time frame, we're also starting to see the robots themselves uh, becoming artificially intelligent because that is also moving forwards. None of this happens in a vacuum. AI is moving very rapidly towards the point of machine consciousness and those smart machines that we might see in the next 10 years will demand their own sex lives. They will demand the same rights that humans have eventually and we will expect to have uh, computers redesigning sex and as they get further and further into our brains we will find that we're designing external uh, extensions to your brain capability which allow you to, to redesign sex with extra, extra genders, extra sex acts and you know the, the stuff which we do today will seem pretty routine and yesterday uh, not very far in the future. So will robots learn how to have sex by watching <coughs> us? I, I, I think that they will very quickly analyze the, the, what they can find on the web and think, well, yeah, that's fine. That's what biology does. Uh, now, where can we build on that? And let's uh, take those same ideas and run with them. And what can we design which is far more fun? And how can we roll that out? Do you think the models that are sometimes freely available on the web, do you think they're the best models from which robots should be learning how to? I think robots, uh, I mean, they can learn something from human beings, but that's uh, the starting point. I see that very much as a starting point. And when we're looking at evolutionary AI development, you put in everything you know about how to possibly do it into an evolutionary engine, and then you let it experiment and discover for itself. And that's the best model, I think. And we could, uh, I mean, just like the, the binars invented the holodeck on Star Trek, you know, the AIs that we have in 10, 15 years' time will redesign the whole of the sexual experience for human beings and find far better ways of uh, producing sexual stimulation. So, you know, today we might think of typing control shift O for an orgasm. Um, it'll be a lot more fun than that as we go into the future. So I should just have an answer with this question already. But, um, <laughs> but I do want to, I don't want to go to, to Kate. So Ian's kind of given us the, the range of possible Futures for both our own bodies, human bodies being augmented by, it uh, sounds like, internal vibrating chips. But you're very specifically focused on this campaign against sex robots. And I wondered if you could explain for the audience who may not know what the campaign against sex robots is, just a little bit about that campaign and, sure. and the reason why you're in defense of the sex robots. Yeah, let's say I'm against the campaign against sex robots. Um, so my work is, uh, my background is in human computer interaction and artificial intelligence. Um, and I think this campaign is incredibly short-sighted. Um, so it was started by two academics, um, Kathleen Richardson and Eric Billings. And their main thrust, as it were, is that um, sex robots, and it is sex robots as they exist today, they do exist. Um, they're basically mechanized sex dolls. Sex robots as they exist today and as they see them developing are essentially uh, objectification of women. It will lead to um, uh, another form of sex work uh, that is essentially um, an anti-feminist movement. And I can see where that is coming from, but uh, however, I would say that that is not the case necessarily and that we should never ever try to shut down technology that's in its infancy. Um, and so what I'm interested in is saying, well, you know what, we've got, we can see where this is going. We know there's an appetite for this. We know there's demand for these, these sex robots. Um, but why should they be, why should they be focused entirely on this very heteronormative male view? Okay, this is um, an era when there is so much exploration going on of, of sexuality, of gender identity, um, and there's a lot of, a lot of very contentious issues being discussed. I mean, you 
don't want to get into one of those debates on Twitter, right? Because <laughs> so I'm staying well away from them. Um, because, and I think that sex robots, robots in general, but specifically sex robots, um, provide us with a kind of a, 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 a blank canvas to start exploring those things. And I think that just to say banal development is really short-sighted, it sort of reeks of moral panic. Um, we've got an opportunity here to take that technology and start to explore what it means um, to have a certain sexuality, what influence sex has on our brains, so the cognitive approaches, the social approaches, um, and our own identities. And we can explore that in terms of artificial intelligence and in terms of how we actually make um, a robot that can feel desire, that can have a sexuality, and doesn't need to have a particular gender, doesn't need to have a particular sexuality. So I think these are all questions that we, if we were to ban sex robots, we'd be shutting down this discussion. So just, if you do want to get in a flame war on Twitter over the next sort of hour and a half, we're tweeting on hashtag the F salon. Um, but Kate, I do, I do want to ask you, you said um, you sort of understand where that desire and the fear against sex robots comes yeah. from. Where does it? Well, from? I mean, I, I think that if you, uh, I think that anybody that would sort of have any kind of declaration of themselves as a feminist, myself included, we do not want to contribute to anything that in any way harms women. So I can see that there is that reaction that it may objectify women, yes. Um, I think that applies to lots of things um, like porn, um, like sex work. But again, this is something that is very, very nuanced. It's something that requires a lot of exploration and debate before we just automatically say, no, that's, that should not happen. Um, and that is something that I don't feel I could automatically take a stance on. I think it needs a lot more exploration and banning something outright is not going to give us that exploration. And thank you, Kate. And Trudy, you've, you've kind of been at the forefront of these debates. I love telling people that I know the UK's <laughs> leading cyber sex book, oh um, which is always a great way to open a, open a conversation and maybe close a conversation <laughs> in a bar. Um, but I, I, I want to ask you what you've seen over the last, um, over the last sort of 15, plus yeah. years, um, Trudy's only 25. Um, <laughs> is there something more nuanced happening <clears throat> here? Is there a, uh, is there, a, I mean, what, where's the reaction coming from? Is it coming from our visceral reaction to anthropomorphic robots that look like us? Or do you actually think there's, a, there's maybe a desire to have sex with robotic things and objects? I think, um, well, ha having, been involved with this sort of research and this kind of theme since about 1991. Um, I've seen various elements of sex and virtual reality. I've seen um, remote controlled vibrators and dildos and all sorts of stuff. I've seen the, the, the sex drive actually becoming part of the drive for innovation. And I'm quite interested in the way that with all this technology, with the access to the internet, with all these things, is that we're, we've totally now divorced the sex act with procreation. And it's now sex act for pleasure. So we're dealing with different types of entertainment. Sex as entertainment, sex as pleasure. Therefore, the doll becomes the toy. The, it, the, I mean, women have been using vibrators instead of men or in, as, well, with men or whatever for millennia. And it's, um, it's kind of an intensification and an amplification of all of this. And I think that, um, that the way that we are in love with our technology, like, like Latour discusses the idea that we, we, we have a a love of our technology, we are embracing it, we become part of our technology, that it's inevitable that we will want to have sex or just have pleasure with the technology. You know, the, the, the thing that the, the videos of um, people unwrapping their iPads, it's fetishistic, it's so sexy. Everything with technology is sexy. And that's why we want to have sex with robots, which is why we want to be the robots. Samsung or iPhone user? Ooh, I'm a Samsung. All right, so Steve Jobs is not to blame. No, it's not <laughs> Steve Jobs' fault, no. So I, I just, you mentioned, uh, Trudy, this, this sex drive is often a drive for innovation. What, what, do, you, what do you mean by that? Well, I think um, it's, it's a drive 
um, to create something new. The sex drive traditionally was to procreate, to create new life. And now we're doing it in a completely different way, with different ways of looking at technology, with different ways of being creative in a more open sense rather than just being human. And that's where it becomes really different. That's where um, having sex with robots, having sex with the technology, you can have a owner hole that you attach to your iPad and you can you know, have a quick old go with, with that whilst you're, whilst you're doing your Skyping with your girlfriend or whatever. You know, it, it's, it's become, it's, it's more of an extension of the McLuhan's extension of man. It's the extension of our very sense of being, I think. And some people feel really alive in that orgasmic moment. And I think we're still all searching for that. So I think it's, the sex robot is part of our evolution. I mean, even budgies will have sex with a plastic budgie in their cage. It's something that's kind of innate in being alive. There's a, there's a reason for the, uh, as I think you've phrased it, the randy budgie. Yeah, that's and it, it, the it randy budgie. From, uh, really the isolation of the budgie, is that it? There, there is the isolationism. There is also the, I mean, I'm quite interested in how uh, a lot of the students I look at, or I'm in a, you know, an academic environment where everybody is like in their iPhones, they become iPhone or mobile phone zombies, and they become part of this sense of self that is so squashed in and so um, in a corridor that it's only inevitable that this kind of behavior with your machine takes on different elements of the self and squashes you in. So it's a whole dichotomy of just expressing pleasure and also expressing a sense of self. So we've seen, and I should ask you, Dan, have we seen these sort of narratives appear um, perhaps in science fiction? You're a professor, you're a senior lecturer in literature at the New College of Humanities, where you look Sorry. at how science fiction narratives both feed forward into the future and reveal something about us and what it means to be human. And I want to ask you, are you, have you already seen this kind of narrative play out before in fiction? Well, to, um, to start with, um, was as, that the right as, question I was supposed to ask? <laughs> as my students can confirm, uh, no, we don't talk much about sex robots. Yeah. Um, 18 grand a year and there's no... <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe, maybe if they're special requests. Um, yeah, of course, we have seen these narratives before and they tap in very directly into the kind of uh, social situations that Trudy is describing. If you think back to Mary Shelley and the most famous mm, example, uh, Frankenstein's monster, Frankenstein's monster learns how to be human from imitating and listening to humans, but what Frankenstein's monster wants in the end is a, is a Mrs. Frankenstein, a, a similar being to himself. But there are lots of more recent examples, and I think, I think most relevant is uh, Isaac Asimov in the 1950s. There's a novel called The Robots of Dawn, which features a humaniform robot, Daniel, with which one of the characters in the novel has a sexual relationship, an illicit relationship, in fact regarding this robot as her partner, as her husband. The interesting thing about that story is the backdrop to it, the society in which it happens. And it's a society in which human contact, touch, has become taboo. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of interesting scientific work on uh, touch um, becoming taboo. Increasingly, we're finding it more and more difficult to touch each other. But then the most recent example, I, I suppose, is the one that you, you know, I, I, I specialize in the works of J.G. Ballard, so every time there's a new story about somebody getting arrested for having sex with tractors or bicycles. <laughs> yeah. My Twitter feed is just kind of a deluge of these stories. Well, that's um, the reason. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, and of course, Ballard wrote this um, famous novel in 1973, Crash, which you may have seen the Cronenberg film of and is famously thought to be about people deriving sexual excitement from having car crashes. But Ballard added a caveat 
he, he famously, or not famously enough, said, actually, that's not what I was doing in that novel. What I was interested in is people getting sexually excited by the idea of car crashes. In a way, that's much more disturbing. And one of the things that's missing from the debate, as I see it generally, is just how much um, sex is happening in the mind, just how much sex is about being stimulated by ideas as much as mechanics. Did you see that in any examples that you came across? The, um, is it 80% fantasy, 20% technology? Um, the... Well, when I, when I did my PhD, I, I um, had the pri privilege of um, studying a, a group of um, people who were playing around with their ideas of gender, but they were also what I would call techno-fetishists. They really loved their computer kit. They loved going online. And this was in the late uh, 90s. And what they did was they created their own server. They built their own server. They also um, ordered a whole load of sort of medical stimulation equipment. And what they did was they would um, have one person volunteer to put on all this kit. So it would be um, things attached to the nipples, to the genitalia, various areas all around the body. It was kind of st like Stellark, really, but it was homegrown. This is the other thing that's always interesting about this. And they, they were connected to a server. And um, the people who were you know, part of this, this group invited other people from around the world to connect on this server and stimulate this individual. Now, while the individual was being stimulated, in their head, they were, well, the, the guy was probably Dave, but in his head, he became Stephanie. And I, I sort of studied and watched <laughs> Stephanie being transformed into Stephanie just purely through this whole um, connection. So you had a group of people that were absolutely passionate about the kit, but they were also passionate about giving pleasure to Stephanie and Stephanie experiencing her transformation, maybe in her, psychologically in her mind, well, definitely, but also she felt afterwards, she felt that she, she was a woman from that experience. And that's a human to human connection mediated by by, a, by yeah, by the technology, and that was it. And, and it was all homegrown. It was like you know garage stuff in in 1998. But but then, Kate, what happens if there is no human sort of feedback? The, the issue with sex robots is is the, the question of whether these things are going to be artificial entities and we're aware they're artificial entities, or we'll have a drive to make them look sound like us, more anthropomorphic. There's been mention of. Uh, not just women, but children as well, to cure pedophilia. Right, I mean, this is, this is one of the areas where sex robots requires a, a <coughs> lot of investigation and work, because um, in terms of artificial intelligence, one of the big goals of artificial intelligence is to create a system, a cognitive system, that behaves like a human. Um, it's not the only goal, but it's, it's a big one. And the idea being that then you will have this sentient uh, machine that can feel, that can desire, that, that can express emotion. Um, if you then, but even without bringing that into it, even without that sentience, you get issues when you say someone makes a, a child robot, child sex robot, okay? This is obviously, um, uh, it's something that would be very concerning um, because we know there's already laws against obscene material featuring children, even if that is generated by a computer, okay? There are laws against that. What happens then when someone makes a child robot as a sex robot? What happens if they make an animal robot as a sex robot? Um, and this is, there's a problem with law, with uh, law and policy. It doesn't, it can't keep up with technological advances very well. And so that needs exploring, that needs um, examining as to what happens when things break social taboos or break legal um, areas, illegal issues. And I think that's, that's an area that requires work. Ian, is there another issue? Is it, the, is it something about the squeamishness or maybe the uncanny valley when it comes to sex robots? And do you think, as a futurist, we'll ever overcome that? Uh, yes and yes. I think there is an uncanny valley, uh, definitely. If you make a robot which looks a little bit human-like, but not very, then a few fetishists will enjoy playing with it, just like a plastic inflatable doll. Uh, most of us will think, oh, I'm not doing that. You know, it's, uh, it's just a pretend thing I want a real human being. Most of us are faced with an uncanny valley and opt for the human being. 
Uh, that is really a technological progress thing. Eventually, we will get to the point where you can make a completely convincing uh, robot doll. Um, but the, the, the other side of it is that you can do an awful lot of that in the virtual reality space. You can do a lot in the augmented reality space. So you could be looking at that uh, you know, plastic inflatable doll, but what you're seeing in your eyes is a completely lifelike um, human being. And you can also do the, you know, with the active skin relays, if you like to call them that, you could make it feel exactly like a real human being as well. So you, what, what you can do with the, the physical technology is a limitation, but you can make up an awful lot of that with the augmented and virtual reality. And that brings us back actually to the, the objectification of women. I think this is a problem. You get objectification of men as well, but you know, most of us men don't care. It doesn't, wor doesn't worry me at all if somebody objectifies me, but it, you know, some women worry about it. Um, but you know, if I'm walking up <coughs> Regent Street back to the train station this evening, if I'm wearing an augmented reality contact lenses and I can look at every single woman I'm walking past and see exactly what she behaves like in bed, exactly what she looks like naked, and I can download all of the stuff off the net of exactly her sexual experiences and stuff, you know, that is the next generation of objectification. And we're heading there at a heck of a rate of knots. This is a problem. You know, I'm not suggesting so, that it's, so uh, we, can we, can't, we can't solve it, but the lawyers will not be able to keep up. And I'm not entirely sure that society will keep up. And a small percentage of people will not find it easy to balance the two and lead a happy, balanced sexual life. So, so was, to, to you Ian, and also to all the panel, what is going to what is going to stop that? And equally, who then owns the datification of your sex experience? I, I don't know. It depends how we build it. I mean, at the moment, it could be anybody under any circumstances in any world, any part of the world. Uh, you know, some kid in a teenage bedroom could be writing this with no control by the authorities whatsoever. It appears on the net, everybody's using it before anybody even thinks about debating it and making laws about it. It's already mainstream culture. And yeah, that's, that's the speed of technology development now. Then probably somebody will want to monetize it. Yeah. So can you imagine, you're in the middle of your cyber sex dream with your artificial doll and suddenly Pepsi <laughs> advert comes yeah. up at the pr appropriate moment. Through your Gillette, the best American. Well, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> Could you ima can you imagine that kind of frightening future that everything, actually, our sexual pleasure becomes entirely part of the the, the capitalist monetizing part of pleasure. Well, well then the even the, worse than it is now. I mean, the campaign about sex robots and the way in which David Levy talks about sex robots is already drawing parallels to, to prostitution yep. and perhaps you could explain. For this okay. audience, at least David Levy's David Levy's, point. David Levy's work, he was one of the um, earlier, uh, did some of the earlier research on sex robots and saw it very much as being a sex work economy with robots taking the place of sex, work, sex workers, um, which is what the campaign against sex robots has, has um, sort of been found to do. Uh, combat this idea that um, it should be, it, that it will lead to more further objectification of women. Um, I don't know that Levy, his vision is necessarily something that that will necessarily come true. It may, but I think we have the chance to shape that. Um, and I think there's a lot more tied into it than just will these robots take the form of sex work. I, I think there's it, sex work is a much more nuanced debate to be looked into mm -hmm. rather than saying a robot will come yeah. along and it will replace a sex worker. Yeah. I mean. So the issues that come specifically with that, I mean, the, the, some of the research that I know that Ian's uh, focused on, that men are the chief buyers of sex and females right are now, the chief yes. buyers of the, the toys, but both said uh, masturbatory objectification well, experience. This is, is a chance this, uh, to bring them together, really. So, you know, you have sex toys, uh, and you have sex work in separate areas. What a, a, a sex robot is this blank canvas still. It's still in its infancy. Why can't we have sex robots that appeal more to just more than the, the straight male. I think there's just so much scope to do this. Who says a sex robot has to look human even? I mean, mm. it can be, mm. it can be anything. Um, yeah, the, there's no limit here. We, we don't have the physical limits when it comes to this sort of thing. You know, we don't, we're not tied to this. We're not tied to a human depiction. We're not tied to any kind of binary. Well, that idea of the, the sex robot could be anything. I know that some of your work in the philosophy of technology, Dan, focuses on so non-human agency and perhaps we 
won't be desiring things that look and feel human, but entirely different technologies. You know what I'm leading to? I do. Dan is like, so Dan was the co-founder of VF. You are the hardest person on the panel. This is Socratic <laughs> method. Uh, his students are sitting there going, I know exactly what's going on here. Talk about biobots, Dan. <laughs> I, actually, I want to lead back to, um, right. lead back to the Asimov thing again. That Asimov story, the, the thing that's interesting about the robot in that is that it's completely humanoid uh, and you can't distinguish between these robots and humans other than for the fact that they obey slightly higher moral standards than humans do which is a lovely idea. And that's the model that we've always taken, and that's the model that we're thinking of right now when we're talking about humanoid robots. And that's the model also for AI, human-like cognition. Except, that's not necessarily the case, uh, the, the direction in which research is going. Because many robots are not moving towards humanoid forms, and they're not moving towards even mechanical forms like Pepper or Terminator is your most famous example. But they're moving towards softer forms, what Rudy Rucker called wetware. Mm. Um, mm. So we've already started to have robots made from uh, sprayable foam or invertebrate rubber robots or indeed programmable chemical gels. Now, that's a kind of world of mixed materiality where you might need a programmer to program digitally, but you're also talking about somebody who's able to program the DNA of something that's half living, half mechanical. And this kind of mixed world, if that starts to intersect with sex robots and you have programmable chemical gel robots, you're moving away from silicon and towards silicone, and that raises. Uh, but then that's not just. Artificial it's, it's a whole. Plans. It's a whole new. That's whole new kettle of ball game. Then, it is yeah. artificial life, yeah. Then what would it mean to to uh, have the sexual act with something that could be alive or living? Well, let's assume that it's alive first of all, in a natural sense, but not necessarily in an AI sense, because not everybody agrees that we're ever going to get AI. We've got AI at the moment, but it's, it's pretty stupid. You know, you think of your GPS or sat-nav systems or what have you. Uh, and that's the sort of level of intelligence of robot that you can look at to have sex with. It's not very enticing, is it? However, if there's a certain natural component to that, that can evolve and grow and change in itself, then we're talking about something slightly less predictable. And we're also, interestingly, in connection with the Internet of Things worry, that if these robots are networked, you know, originally we used the phrase computer virus as a, as a metaphor from biology. There's no real viruses. But if you're having sex with a bacterial, quasi, bio-hybrid thing. Whoa. We start to see, start to see the, uh, the metaphor becoming literal again. So isn't no, I don't want to scare anyone. Spot of rust, dear. Spot of rust. Well, obviously wetware for a, for a reason in, in that case. Uh, Ian, I want to I wanna jump back to, to you if I can. So the idea, of what are these things going to look like in our, in our, at least in our short term? So I know the, the Dara report that you were involved with said that virtual sex would be here um, and it would be uh, as casual as porn by 2030. Uh, by 2025, robotic sex toys will be available for the wealthy. By 2035, sex toys will interact with virtual reality. And by 2050, robo-sex may overtake human sex. So I just wonder where those trends have emerged from and what you think is going to drive some of those, some of those trends? Yeah, what, what's, what's driving my thinking on that timeline is the uh, stuff I'm observing about the growth of, of AI 
And you know, it's not all digital stuff. There's a lot happening in the analog domain and AI development as well. And we will end up with computers which are very sensitive to human emotions. That's been a goal in, in R&D and IT companies now for well over a decade. We've been trying to make computers more emotional and more receptive and uh, responsive to human emotions. So picking up the emotions of the people and directly responding to that is a big thing. And you can do it. We know how to do it. We know how to detect the emotions. And we, we have some of the AI skills to respond to that. And that's, that whole field's moving on. Uh, also, people like Honda and Sony and all the other big IT manufacturers are desperately trying to make robots to work around our home, do physical jobs, do the cleaning, but they also want to make jobs which are really good at companionship. And the best model we have for that is to make them very human-like with nice personalities and nice emotional responses. So we will get those robots. You'll probably buy one the same price as a, as a reasonable price car. And you will have one in your house, which you, you might as well buy one that you fancy as one that's big yeah. ugly. Well, this is, well, this and is the and then you will end up having sex with it. But that's Ian, this where is it's the problem that's arisen, and it was, is part of the reason for the campaign against mm. sex robots. If you buy Pepper now, which Ooh, is we can't a, which sex is a, Pepper. Will you, you have to sign a clause saying... You have to sign a clause then, you will not have sex with Pepper. Pepper is a social companion robot in Japan. Um, and it's specifically written into the contract that it will void the guarantee and null the warranty if you have sex with, do not have sex with Pepper. Um, well, this is it. I mean, this is the thing. So the compa companion robots exist. Um, we have companion robots in the home, uh, beyond just the robot vacuum cleaner. And, um, you know, big in Japan. Um, and. So these things are already there. We have um, assistant healthcare robots. And there's a big EU drive to um, explore this. There's um, a whole EU initiative about companion robots and care robots. Um, and so it's, up, it's, it's about how those are going to be exploited. And you know, if you have to actually write that into the clause, and there's definitely someone's been trying that somewhere, OK? There's, there's no, definitely there's been a reason for that. <laughs> there's yeah. a reason they've written this in. Um, and you know, I think while, while it may be unpalatable for companies at the moment to explicitly state that they're going to go down that route of research, I think it's inevitable that they will. Although, you know, it's taken Dyson 16 years to produce robot vacuum cleaners, so don't hold your breath for a Dyson one <laughs> anytime soon. But um, I think that it's unavoidable. Yeah, I agree with you. But there's no clause against the suction on a... Uh, I, a I would not like to speak for Dyson. <laughs> I haven't looked at the small print. I'm not asking for me, just <laughs> FYI. But, but Trudy, would it be, yeah. uh, would it be, is it going to be productized or is there going to be a whole sort of open source DIY movement? Some of the things you talked about are the, the semi female shaped objects and DIY fuck pinatas. Oh, yes. That's oh, yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> How did we forget yes. the fuck pinatas? <laughs> there are people who have made their own artificial woman out of bits of paper and cardboard and a rubber glove. Oh, and I, oh, you just would not Don't imagine. Don't I thought of that. <laughs> but one of, the, <laughs> behave. one of the things that we were talking about there just made me think, when you think of the future and all these sex robots and everything that, that could be created, a lot of the population is going to be a lot older. Now then, we're going to be losing our partners. They're going to die. So will there be a way of actually having, you know, the robot um, personal assistant or helper that could represent the partner that we've had for 20 years or something? And could we still, could we say, oh, um, I want, um, say that I've got the lovely Ed as my partner. Could I have the lovely Ed as he was 10 years ago? No, 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 you see what I mean? You could technically say, I mean, if you were like with somebody you, you for like. Do, you do realise I'm a robot, you haven't noticed. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> um, but I mean, you could have in, in long term relationships when they, when they, they die, they, your, your partner dies, and you've got this new technology, this robotic technology. Are you going to say, actually, I don't want to have this new person, I actually want the person back that I've lost? So. So there's precedent. There's for... yeah. There's there's a different. There's maybe there's other ways that we can have our conversations with our robots that actually give us something back, something that we've lost. And maybe that's something why we're talking about robots because maybe there's something about being ourselves that we have lost. 
and maybe an attempt to reclaim it through creating artificial versions of ourselves. So, so back to, the, again, the science fiction narratives that have dealt with these issues of versions of ourselves and anthropomorphism. I mean, obviously that's precedent for having something that looks and sounds yeah. like someone yeah, who exactly. existed as yeah. human. But again, what are the sort of expressions of a robot that would express its own sexual identity? Well, how can we start thinking about mm. that? How, how can we start thinking about... Uh, I haven't quite got it. How can we start thinking about a robot expressing desire? Well, no, a robot expressing its own morphology, its own way of being, perhaps robots having sex with each other. What would synthetic biobots, would they have sex lives? Bacterial sex, yes, of a kind. I, th I think we start... What, one of the ways we tend to trap ourselves is by thinking purely in terms of um, the frame of AI and robots in general, which is around mechanical and digital computing. And I think what we want to do instead is start thinking about the animal world, not just the artificial world. We want to start thinking about nature and the way in which natural computing is starting to blend those two worlds. And once you start doing that, then you start to see that the people who, uh, the science fiction writers who were the real visionaries, were perhaps not people like uh, Asimov, who provided you with a vision of a hum humanoid robot that you're having sex with, but indeed somebody like J.G. Ballard, who's talking about these very strange people deriving sexual satisfaction from engaging with architecture, for example. Now, there's an idea. Synthetic biology is also working in architecture. We, we're starting to have living architecture, living buildings. Now, what about having sex with a building? It depends on the building. So, somebody <laughs> married the Ivel Tower, didn't they? <laughs> they did. A woman married the Ivel Tower. She's but there's a whole... There's a whole <laughs> well, it, it, to your point, really, there's a yeah. whole move of people who are interested in having sex with robots. That, is, is it called... Um, Correct me if I'm wrong, but yeah. fauna, faunophilia? Oh, crikey, I don't know. There's so many versions of sort of philias. Faunophilia. Faunophilia. Is it faunophilia? Well, that's, right. that's using them as mannequins or, or yeah, statues. Yeah, statues. Yeah. Which you can do, yeah. Oh, it's... it's... <laughs> <laughs> right. And yeah, it's, it's, it's <laughs> that's one of the earliest. Just to give you a point of information, somebody had an affair with a train in the London Transport Museum. An ongoing serious. affair? I wanted to marry yeah. them. Bless. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, one of the earliest stories that we have of this artificial life for sex purpose is Pygmalion and his sculpture, yeah. Yeah. where yeah. He, you know, he brought it to life with a kiss because yeah. he wanted to have this statue and possess it and have a sexual relationship with the statue. So, you know, nothing new under the sun. But, but, well, nothing new under the sun, but do you think those... those do you think when, when there is a lack of awareness, full stop, about um, sort of how our relationship to objects currently or to mm. technology currently is guiding our uh, way of thinking about the, the race and the gender and the design of these robots to, to pretty much all the, all the panel? I, I think it's how, mu it, it's how we perceive pleasure and how pleasure is communicated. And if you're talking about sort of the, the whole sort of um, biotechnology and that sort of these um, uh, entities having sex with each other, we're talking about different realms of experiencing pleasure and how do we define pleasure and how do we express it and how is my pleasure different to your pleasure and just is that part of how we identify each other by the way that we have we experience pleasure because as i was saying we've kind of divorced um, the sex act from procreation we're now just looking at notions of pleasure so it opens up a whole new arena for um, experiencing just a being alive and maybe sex robots could be part of that beginning of that kind of exploration of so, pleasure. The, so with regards to just this conversation in, in general, we've been lucky that both Mandara's allowed us to be here and likes us over about allowed us to be here to have this conversation. But how do we have these sort of conversations mm. about something which is borderline taboo? And I'm referring to the fact that David Levy and Adrian Sheok's second Congress of Love and Sex with Robots. You may have seen this 
I'm on uh, the committee and I reviewed the, the papers and I was um, the papers were superb and I was thinking, so, oh my goodness. So just to just to explain, if, if you haven't seen the yeah. if you haven't seen the um, the recent press, the there was a, a gentleman called Adrian Shiok who's very much focused on the hardware side. He's known for the the kissing the Kissinger. kissing robots and the hugging yeah. vests. Um, he's at City of London University, I think. He's based in Malaysia at the moment, and um, the. Congress, which I know Kate's been involved in the first um, sex, uh, Love and Sex, the Robots Congress, mm. was actually cancelled by the Malaysian police, the Malaysian mm. chief of police, on the, on the proviso that there was uh, uh, nothing scientific about sex with a robot. Um, in Malaysia, we do not allow anal sex and with robot neither. So this was, <laughs> this uh, direct translation. Um, so this was... This, this conversation is already being, um, I mean, Malaysia is a very special case, but it's very easy to get, um, especially when it comes to talking about future and tech, when those collide, it's very easy to get giggly and excited about these mm. discussions in the wrong way. How do we have an informed discussion? Yeah, okay? I mean, how I do we do it? How do we do it? I wish, I wish I'd completely answer. I think being very open about it is one thing. I mean, I, um, I remember at one point at a, at a research lunch, conference lunch, talking to someone and actually using the words actuate and vagina. And then I realized that I've just used the words actuate and vagina in a research conversation. This is, to other people, this might be weird. Um, I, I think it's something we should be really open about. And I, I just refuse to get phased about it anymore. And um, because that's the way things are going. In, t in the case of conf uh, the conference in Malaysia, I think that was perhaps not the wisest choice of venue in terms of cultural decision making, you know, we hosted a Love and Sex with Robots symposium at Goldsmiths in 2014 and yeah. it was very successful, yeah. we had a documentary crew along to film it as well, um, it was part of the ASB, um, Artificial Intelligence Simulated Behaviour Convention that I was co-chairing there um, and David Levy came along to, to talk about the work there um, and there was a lot he, he came to us first of all and said well look we want to do this conference but we've got a lot of very explicit material, um, is it going to be okay to show this and we went hey we're goldsmiths right, <laughs> like any Thing goes here, and unfortunately, that was the case. Um, and it was, uh, it was a uh, had a big draw. It had a big draw. All the media coverage for the convention was like, Oh, do you know there's a love and sex with robots? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's my microphone. Sorry, is it still working? <laughs> um, I get too animated it's, um, about this. Thank you. So, yeah, I think. Um, I think it, it's about being really open about it and making it getting public engagement, making things. Um, really explicit if you pardon the pun but just to try and, and encourage people to talk about it and I think technology has, is something that allows us to do that with the internet you know with people using the web more and more you've seen a lot of more work around around um, sexuality and gender identity politics and all that sort of stuff that would not have arisen without the internet and so I think that that's a chance to progress that in terms of sexual rights. One, one of the things well, I, yeah, yeah, one of the things I, yeah, I was part of um, the, the, the conference and stuff, but well, the, the thing you're mentioning about um, making it more open, having more people talking about it, one of the things I, I'm quite interested in at the moment is um, the advent of uh, haptics, of course, with social media. And there, there are people now experimenting with um, a kind, well, I'm calling them, uh, was it multiple um, open haptic online orgies or mohus, <coughs> where you've got all lots of people joining together having this kind of haptic sexual sensation. And because we've got social media and things like Facebook and stuff, where people are actually you know, being open, talking about things and co communicating in that way, that the next step is the feely version of it. And I think maybe that might be part of the groundbreaking element to get everybody talking about these things. So, so Ian, do you think it's going to go the way of online dating? Is it one of these things that we talk about in Soho in a, in a panel and in a couple of years' time it's suddenly advertised on billboards? Um, yeah, I think a lot of it will happen via that kind of route. But we're starting to see in mean, online communities, one of the biggest virtual communities online, of course, is Second Life. And they're already bringing Oculus Rift into there, and they're already starting to explore it. And next year, another generation of that technology comes out with... Uh, but, you know, there, there is already a very vibrant sexual community in Second Life. That's most, probably most of the people are in Second Life for that reason. And that is today's sort of dating technology, and it's how people experiment 
and people are messing around with all sorts of things like converting other people into statues and mannequins and locking them electronically in place. And yet at the same time, neuroscientists are discovering how to do that in real life. You know, you apply a voltage to the right part of your brain and you can actually freeze somebody and switch off their consciousness and uh, you can stimulate the uh, vagus nerve, you create orgasms and stuff. So, you know, we're starting to link together what you can do inside cyberspace with what you can do in, in real life. But there's a really important bit that we've, we've missed so far in this conversation, I think, which is the, uh, the transgender community mm. has also been doing a great deal of the uh, exploration of the next frontiers in this. And you get a man that wants to be a woman or vice versa occasionally, um, you could do that electronically. You know, I could buy a female robot maybe in 20 years. I can link my nervous system into that, you know, maybe use some enhancement, extra little bits in the IT and the cloud to provide extra mapping space to link on the female genitalia and so on. I could be uh, female in a, in a much stronger way than I could today, you know, going and getting an operation uh, far east somewhere. And I, I, th I think that it's, it, it's a very uh, strong way of developing the next generation of this kind of technology. So what is it you object to? I'm, I'm sorry, the idea that I, you're making a social judgment. I mean, being, being male or female is much a social role as it is a physical role. And the saying that having a robot is more authentically female in any sense than a, than a trans person experiences being their actual gender, that is hugely problematic. I'm sorry for interrupting you. I, I, I don't believe I said that. I mean, I said it was a tool that they can use. Um, it, it is a, I'm saying that that community can use that as a technique. I'm not saying that's the best way of them doing it. I'm not providing any value judgment. I'm just saying that the technology will be feasible. That's all I'm saying. I'm not creating any value judgment on that at all. So, so I'm you just observing that the technology will become possible. So do you think then, the problem becomes the feedback loop. So we anthropomorphize these robots and then we slowly want to become them. I don't, I don't think that having the technology available will necessarily force a lot of people to go down that route. But people who do want to go down that route, it's an extra option for them. And because some people might want to do that, and because they're doing it in a, in a community which is, I think at the moment, it's actually got quite a lot of, of, of backing. And a lot of us are very supportive of the transgender community, I think that that might be something where we can all agree that, yeah, we can go down that way a little bit faster than we would have done otherwise because some people might benefit from it, uh, whereas otherwise we might have been very wary of it and tried to make laws against it. So it might open certain frontiers which might otherwise be more difficult to, to penetrate. And I think that's a good thing. So maybe less on changing gender, but do you think we will want to make ourselves more robotic? I know, Trudy, you've looked at, um, uh, let me get the terms right, androidism and yeah. maskers. Um, yeah. Androidism of the uh, music artist Janelle Monae. And yeah. If you could explain maskers. Yeah. Um, the maskers are um, mostly guys that like to completely dress up um, in complete, usually complete rubber suits as, and they like to see themselves as the opposing gender. So mostly it's, it's men who want to become these women, but they're wearing complete masks and they're wearing complete body suits. And um, they, they like, it's kind of like what I was um, talking about with my earlier research where you had this group of people who connected themselves up to the technology. But this is a kind of, um, it's a, a, a fetishistic group that do this because there, there's a certain connection with the actual material that they cover themselves with, which is like rubber. But I'm, but I'm particularly interested in, um, in transgender um, really quite importantly because I think it's part of the research into innovation and it's part of that drive to be what you think you really should be that is part of that in innovative drive. And part of that is your sexuality and your gender. And um, I'm quite interested in, in the transition process from one gender to the other. And I'm, I'm starting to look at a, a certain research project, which I, I won't really go into because it's in the very early stages, but looking in, in, uh, in terms of not necessarily robotics as such, but in terms of um, animated holographics in order to 
um, identify different elements of um, sexuality and ideas of gender, but depending if you perceive gender as being performative. So there's lots of different layers going on that we can assume about gender, which may not be the case as well. So it's a, it's a marvelous um, bowl of different things that we can look at about sexuality, about gender, about pleasure, about entertainment, about procreation, about our creative urges, about our innovation. And I think just it's, I mean, you guys are in this, this, this time where all these things are happening. I just wish and hope that I will still be able to see it in my lifetime in almost a transhumanist or posthumanist future. So I think, so look, the great thing about Virtual Future Sound is you guys are curated as heavily as these guys. And I would love to spend about half an hour opening up to audience um, questions. I will have to just say this now, we are recording. Um, if you don't want your contribution placed on the web, please come and see me afterwards. We're recording both the audio and uh, film. So, um, but don't let that stop you asking a question. We'll be more than happy to edit it out. So I would love to open it up to, to this audience for the next sort of half an hour. Please, sir. I'm confused. Um, oh. <laughs> All right, another hour. So... Because we seem to have started with an assumption about what we mean by sex. And uh, truly it was clear that uh, sex is now separate from procreation, although we'll still need some sort of procreation. Um, but you then jumped immediately to saying that sex was about pleasure. And I, I wonder if that's, if that's what we're all agreed on, but it's a very specific type of pleasure. And it also must have some correlation with relationship, hasn't it? Can I say that from a, so from the artificial intelligence point of view, from a cognitive systems point of view, um, I'm interested in sex as a fundamental human motivator. So mm -hmm. it's something that is absolutely fundamental and vital to being human in that, you know, we are here to procreate. Although, you know, so it's individual. It can but be individual. It can be individual. But I think that human human uh, sex no longer has to mean procreation. In human terms, we can procreate without the actual sex act. Um, that's why mm. you know, IVF and things like that. So it is yeah. actually divorced from it in human yeah. terms as well. Yeah. Um, in, in terms of is it for pleasure, I, I don't know. I mean, it's associated um, with, as, as a colleague of mine, uh, Chris, who's a sexual psychologist, will say, it's associated with a, a whole raft of different well-being measures. So it mm. is intrinsic to our lives. It's valuable to our lives. Yeah. Um, so I'm interested in seeing how it, how it impacts our brain, how it impacts our way of thinking. Well, one of the things I'm, I'm quite interested in as well is the idea of the synesthetic orgasm. So um, it depends if you see things, if you hear things, if you sensate differently in your orgasmic moment or your, your, your identification of pleasure. And I'll be interested to see how that would translate within um, a digital culture. Please. Um, oh, okay. Some of us are hunters. Some of us like to find someone attractive and go and get them. And what strikes me about technology is that it's a very lazy way of experiencing pleasure because everything is, you can customize it, you can order a robot, you know, you can get an orgasm at the end of the day, but where is this pursuit aspect and this aspect that, mm, he might not like me, or, <laughs> you know, um, just trying to, you know, this interaction, this uncertainty that's kind of inherent in pursuit. Um, and with technology, it's just a little bit kind of, you know, you just get it. I perhaps so. want to go to Dan and Ian. Is it going to be dumb AI? It's like, can a robot actually, like, pick me up in the bar? You know? Have you, uh... <laughs> <laughs> you can program it in. <laughs> or it's just like... Yeah. You, you have... You have great faith in the capacity of technology to provide what you want, but I would ask you, since when have you used any piece of technology that didn't stop working, break down, battery runs out, update fails, you're sitting there waiting, you know, I mean, let me not mention Apple and, yeah, the kind of experiences you can get there. Um, in other words, machines go wrong a lot, a hell of a lot. 
And there's, uh, there's an artist called Cecile B. Evans. I was talking at with Art Dubai earlier this year, and that talk is, is online, you can watch it. And Cecile, Cecile was resident at the Serpentine, and she made a, a very interesting video project of um, an imperfect, glitched copy, uh, a kind of AI type copy of uh, the actor Philip Seymour Hoffman. Um, the data, it wasn't intentional, but the data she was using glitched. She got all sorts of noise in the signal, and so when she actually runs this, you've got this uh, bot of Philip Seymour Hoffman, but it doesn't quite behave right, gets things wrong, gets a bit mixed up. I think, in actual fact, we need to, we need to start thinking about you know, the, the sheer unreliability of the platform as well, which may, by some people, be regarded as a positive rather than a negative if you're looking for the unpredictable. <laughs> Will we get the full play VR, Ian? Um, we, we have to solve that problem. That we, that, that, I mean, that's an excellent point. Technology today breaks down. Uh, the body doesn't break down in quite the same way. You might have a heart attack or a stroke or something like that, and it might break down. But generally speaking, our bodies are fairly immune to that kind of provocation that crashes our today's computers very easily. Um, if we get the solutions to that, and we have to get the solutions to that because we're very vulnerable to attack by terrorist groups and rogue governments and any mad scientist that comes around in 15, 20 years' time, we have to solve that as a separate problem in technology anyway. If we do, and then we have a more robust technology platform on which to base all these future things, then we can provide the things with any personality that you like. So if you want someone that's really easy to pick up in the bar, well, you know, just snap your fingers and they come running. If you want to have a big fight over it, then you can, you know, it'll take you weeks and weeks and weeks to chat them up because you get exactly, you've got to get to really know them before they're even showing any interest at all. I mean, there isn't a single form of sex bot that's going to come along to be as diverse as humans will be, and probably more diverse because you've got more dimensions to play with. So it'll be whatever way you want it to be, um, or whichever way somebody else wants to be that wants to force them on you. So, you know, there's a, a rich diversity of, of, of sex bots coming down the road. I mean, I find something problematic about it being what you want it to be, rather than mm. expressing its own. Mm. I think it is mm. potentially problematic, but it's, it, it's, it's the same. I mean, we face these sorts of problems every day. I mean, do you cycle to work and make yourself fit and eat salad for lunch? Or do you uh, get a car to work and have a Big Mac you know, for lunch and, uh, and um, sort of die 25 years early of a heart attack? You know, we make those sorts of trade-offs every day in life. It's not a new one. Um, we've always had the, you know, do you want it to be, you know, do you want to do things properly and in a, you know, a rich human-like way, or do you just want to get into bed quickly and you know, get your orgasm and move on to something else? Well, I, I think yeah. Veronica's question to an extent was, you know, do you want the cheat code? Up, up, left, left, right, right, triangle, triangle, square, square, <laughs> orgasm. <laughs> I mean, um. there's, there's, there's nothing to stop you making it as human-like as you want. Uh -huh. You can make it as machine-like as you want. There is a vast spectrum, and you can put it anywhere on that line. And whether you buy it and have it customized or whether you buy something off the shelf that's designed by some guy in, in Apple or something, you know, that's your free choice to do that. You can pay over the odds and get it customized exactly to your requirements, or you could just buy one from a manufacturer. Uh, what is interesting, though, is the moment that we've got a... Uh, the, the, the potential manufacturers are actually very, very squeamish about this. When I play with my Xbox and I'm playing this game called Skyrim, and um, you know, I've been playing it far too long, really. But you know, every day, I'm chopping people's heads off and blood spurts everywhere. But perish the thought that I might see a nipple on that program. You know, the, 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 the Xbox, I mean, Microsoft are terrified of having any nudity on any of their programs. On a PC, you'll get people that will hack into it and allow mm. you to do that. But mm. it's a, you know, that mod community will do it. But on, on, the, on the pure... Uh, Xbox platform, they will not. And you know, we we have this idea that you can have lots of blood and guts and be as nasty as you possibly want to be in a computer game, but you must never see anybody naked. And I have to wonder, you know, we're talking about all these sex bots and all this wonderful future that we might have, or terrible future. 
uh, will we actually have that choice or will the, the Googles and the Microsofts of this world decide that it's not in their brand's corporate interest mm. and you will only be able to get it through the mod community the way you got the, you know, the sex VR stuff in the early 1990s. Mm. You know, it, might, we might be as, it might be as difficult as that. And this was the issue with GTA, but it's a whole other hmm. video game. Yeah, I was just going to say, if I mean, it's a long way off having machines that are sentient, but if they were, then who says they're going to want to have sex with us? So, you know, this yeah. is the thing, if you start introducing sentience in some degree, you start looking at things like free will, autonomy, consent, all these sorts of issues as well, but again, that's a, that's a long way off. Uh, robots are going to look at us and go, no, thank you. Yeah, no, perhaps, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> they say they won't. Uh, robots, no, thank you. Uh, please, yeah. Um, given Dr. Pearson just said about So next, yeah. my friend. I know what's coming. Yeah. All right, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you, you have that one or two percent gig community all the time pushing forwards the, the barriers, and they will always, you know, buy the latest tech and they'll make their own. Uh, they'll mod whatever is going, and they will make it happen. Um, and then, very slowly afterwards, the rest of society adapts, and gradually the markets start appearing for buying all the other sanitized versions of that according to what people will accept that the current did. But you know, the, the that, that whole value base that society has is on a free run. You know, we've thrown religion in the bin quite some time ago, but there aren't any, there aren't any really strong anchors anymore for that moral base. And things that you consider to be immoral today, you might perfectly be happy with in 15, 20, 30 years' time. So I don't think you can preempt the discussion of what will be allowed in, say, 2045, 2050. A lot of that might be... Yeah. You're happy to see nudity, but robots are not in the Bible. No, they're or not. Or any other kind of religious document, as far as I'm aware. No, but there's the <laughs> argument. But there's the argument. So, so the reason why, <laughs> the reason why uh, perhaps the East is slightly more open to the idea of uh, robots having souls is because there wasn't Judo Christian religion to say that objects cannot have soul as such. Living objects. Non-objects. Um, <laughs> Please do. Um, I'm going to have to make a Blade Runner reference. Um, by leaving aside the do androids dream of electric sheep, which is going the whole wrong direction. Um, the, the character in Blade Runner, Fritz, was described as a standard pleasure model. Do we think that actually what we're going to end up is something considerably more mundane? what we've said here, I mean, actually you get, yeah, essentially, mostly vanilla sex robots, rather than this weird spectrum of fantastic fetishes and stuff. You know, are we going to end up with some essentially standard sex? Uh, if, if, I mean, you, if you've got your, your standard sex robot and you are a particular fetishist or you're a sadomasochist, you will do what you want to that robot. They'll forget safe words because they won't feel pain. What, what, what's the moral issues there? And the, the, the problem is, is the, um, the rights of the robot then we're looking at. Do, do the, there, there are ethical discussions to do with the rights of the robot. Should you have robots that will allow themselves to be beaten and caned and tied up and suspended and all this kind of stuff, just so that you can be, uh, get your sadistic, uh, <coughs> feelings out your sec if you're a sexual sadist. So um, it's, a, it's, it's tricky whether you, I mean, there have been discussions at, at, um, at Goldsmiths, uh, there's some quite interesting discussions on uh, legal issues about the, the legalities and the social consent. rights, uh, the consent of the robot. Yeah, that film Blade Runner was actually a very good one in a lot of ways. I mean, the more, I mean, the, uh, Pris was a, an interesting basic pleasure model, but Rachel 
was very much more sophisticated. I think it was Nexus 7 or something. Mm. Uh, my daughter is named after Rachel from the Blade Runner film, by the way. Um, <coughs> she, she, and she knows that too, so it won't be a big surprise to her. <laughs> but it's, uh, you know, Rachel in that film is as sophisticated and passes quite happily as a human being. And she raises all sorts of, you know, moral issues and deep philosophy during that film as well. You know, she is exactly the sort of person that you would spend time chatting up in a bar to get her to go to bed with you. You know, you would treat her pretty much the way you would with another human being. And I think that's the, I think that's actually quite a realistic future. The only arguable thing is which date it happens. It's, it's, science fiction is usually set a couple of decades too early, but you know, by 2050, you will have Rachel on, on, on Blade Runner. I would say the way things are going practically at the minute, you can go and buy a sex robot now, mm. such as the True Companion one, the Roxy one, for about what, $6,000, yeah. something yeah. like that. And they're going to have a male version called Rocky. And, you yeah. know. Um, but it, we're, we're also living in a time when customizability is a huge part of technology. And mm. you know, why, why shouldn't you design your own made-to-order sex bot? I mean, would your sex bot have hair? I mean, just this kind of thing. Would, would it have you know, two legs? <laughs> mm. uh, how many heads would it have? I mean, you can you can you could design your own and make it. There's a, we're, we're moving to a making community. I don't see why that's. Right. Uh, I think the big problem is, and going back to Cecil's work, whose face would it have? Oh, Peter mm. Capaldi's. Uh. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Isn't, isn't the problem though that with like <clears throat> Roxy is that people could design their own? Like it's really interesting what you're saying about the design, but because Roxy's the most like been designed she will become the most popular and as i understand it roxy has gps to the local nando's and like fast food <laughs> yeah, so, so what get advertising she can tell you where yeah. to get kfc she can tell you where to get nando's and mcdonald's she can tell you your fit designed for a man yeah. and she's got different settings like slutty sadie and shy sarah yeah. who reluctantly has sex with you so yeah. that's a really horrible model right but like that's going to be the one that's going to be the fastest selling new sex it model. is because, because people aren't going to have the money and the and, and the ethics of the designers of roxy 2000 are mm. really questionable yeah so surely that's why like it's really important that there's some kind of like society or legal intervention to make sure that we don't just roll out roxy i think i think that's the interesting thing is that when you get a lot of technology, you're always going to get people who try to subvert it and, and customise it. And hopefully, hopefully, they will reject that in favour of doing their own. I mean, I'd really like to see that happen. But yeah, that's, it's kind of grim, the Roxy will, thing. Will, sorry, will, will Nando's actually have special evenings where you can take your robot, Roxy robot to it if she's, if she's got a well, GPS? Well, about how that might be avoided. Yeah, but I mean, I mean, are we going to be able, are we going to sit in a, in the local pizzeria and have people there with their robot partners? I mean, if Nando's is your first date choice, I think it's safe with, with yeah. the robot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a advertising industry, sex industry, that behaves in a certain way with a certain set of predefined behaviours and activities that might produce the uh, Susie, Sarah, Nando, sex robot, more than anything else. And what is a good way to deal with that and disrupt that in that kind of way? Well, for me, the, the alternative would be to produce an alternative. Rather than go out and say, look, House of Commons, rah, 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 this is horrible for all these reasons, please legislate against it, they're not going to know how to do that. But we might be able to produce, actually manufacture and produce the, the means to manufacture alternatives. So there's a lot of processes to all tonight, a lot of alternatives that you might offer. Ben, you mean like Ian's mentioned a Skyrim? You're going to be sitting on that character creation screen for hours and hours on end? Well, actually, there are some fairly simple pieces of technology that challenge our preconditions of sexuality. For me, the idea that we liberate sexuality from its current social behaviors into something that is just purely pleasure driven challenges the question, what is it like to live? Why am I awake? Mm. Why am I doing this? Mm. And we've got to ask that question. Mm. And it mm. is different. Mm. Mm. I think I agree that it's um, yeah. sex as a sense uh, as being embodied as being part of our existence uh, I think is a very interesting thing and I like the idea of challenging things that's exactly my, my point with the campaign against sex robots instead of trying to ban things we should be exploring it instead mm. and make, open it up yeah. to much wider um, exploration yeah. they shouldn't mine would be mm. I, I, yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I'm not part of the campaign against sex robots absolutely not question here <laughs> then I'll say yours and then yours. have any of you 
any of you ever seen uh, or read Jennifer Haley's The Nether? You know, it was yeah. a play of the World War II, 2014, where in a in a future where we can all put ourselves into pods and live as avatars on the internet, there is a part of the internet where you can visit, have sex with, and brutally murder small children. Um, but those those children are themselves played as avatars by adults because the government has legislated as such that you can't. Uh, children themselves couldn't experience that, but adults can put themselves into a child's body um, and gain sexual pleasure from. Being, being killed or, or tortured as a child, um, but the, I think the big takeaway point from from that, I mean, to me, from the the play was that actually it was more about the human impact on those people who were playing the the children, or or who were as an adult having sex with a child that they knew was an adult, um, than the ethics of whether or not we should be having children robots to have sex with. The more important point was the, I think, the behaviour that it, the, the effect, the emotional effect it had on on those people who were playing children. And I guess my question is more about, um, you know, if we have the perfect woman or perfect man or the perfect bio gel to have sex with, how does that affect our own behaviour? And whether there's studies about how that is affecting our own sexual behaviour with other humans? I think I think mentioning the the um, behaviour with children. Um, it's a specific type of uh, fetishistic behaviour dealing with children and it's, to do, it's something to do with power. So um, the way you're looking at sex and power would be a way t to deal with that but it's, not, it's slightly different than dealing with um, different forms of sexual pleasure because there are elements of power that, that go on here that I think are quite divorced from other elements of, of adult to adult sexual pleasure. So I think um, the ethics to do with power and childhood are something that's quite another different argument to be had or discussion to be had in terms of how we look at paedophilia, how we look at um, the, the child robot and how we, how we look with, how we engage with our sense of sexual power over an individual. And that, that's where I think that, that argument could take on a t totally new, different form of discussion. And I think we need to have those kinds of discussion in order to be able to help um, this, the different sort of cultures that deal with issues of, of child sex and power. The pro problem is though, Trudy, isn't it, um, that conversations like this mm. are very rarely possible. Yeah. And that it is precisely an art that these ideas can be explored because art is somehow seen as virtual in itself, as a, a playground, a laboratory, uh, somewhere where the limits and taboos are kind of thrown out and we can kind of push that as far as possible as an experiment. Um, it quite amuses me that we were talking about um, the conference being banned in Malaysia and going, oh, bad choice of venue, because as somebody who's lived outside of the UK for a very long time and only just come back, the idea of talking about sex in Britain <laughs> is, is you know, I would have thought this is just about the worst place in the world to actually try and have these conversations. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, fair point. Um, but one of the things that we can, can talk about, and I think it comes back to the, the first question almost about definitions of sex. Um, we've been talking about procreation having been subtracted and we've talked about pleasure. And the one thing that we haven't talked about as a, an ordinary function of sex is communication. Mm. Uh, nobody's really mentioned that and I just wanted to flag it up as something which... Yeah, the Facebook... Which the art, mm. uh, in, which theatre explicitly foregrounds. And as that example does. Can I actually, on that point, what you said about how does it affect our relationship with others, and I think that's really interesting because in terms of anyone who's in an established monogamous relationship, what happens if you introduce a sexual bot into that? Is it infidelity? Um, what's the line between sex toy and, and sex robot? Um, where does the idea of you know, faithfulness come into it? Are you, are you cheating on your partner if, if you, you know, you're, you're using this sex robot? How much sentience does it have to have? How much autonomy does it have to have before it becomes a third party in your monogamous relationship, for example? 
As, as part of some sexual therapies, a, a surrogate sexual partner is brought in any, anyway as part of sexual therapy, marital relationship therapy. So maybe a sex bot might actually make that a bit more easier. Or in couples. terms of sexual surrogacy in the case of disability, where mm. someone is, is um, mm. providing some sort of sexual therapy and sexual help to yeah. somebody, perhaps. Yeah. There's only even a question. Yeah, we've kind of reached why I wanted to ask my question really. It's picking up on some cases earlier on about we well, touched on sort of the necessity of um, sex as we know it, not just the mechanics, but the intimacy for our well being mm -hmm. and for our interconnectedness. And also, I mean, it's clear that when there's a goal for sex education and people are looking to porn and share sort of like just the mechanics, the, the pumpings of things, but then there's a real loneliness when it comes to intimacy because sex mm -hmm. becomes a performance and not an interaction. Um, and I think that leads to negative impacts on mental health in our society. Mm. And also, I mean, there were studies recently about, um, especially young people, overusing um, their iPhones, like only really interacting with their screens, and that not only leading to lack of sleep, anxiety, depression, and also a lack of being able to interact with people, being socially inept, not being able to be touched without thinking it's weird. Um, but then also, in an addition, there's the element of this augmented reality of Facebook, of social media. Again, feeding into anxiety, people looking to these sort of augmented, perfected ideals of what's possible, and then becoming anxious and having very low self-esteem. So I guess my question is about if we're going into this sort of like sexual roboticized future where it's man versus octo mark and it's like, um, like <laughs> there are all of these perfect ideals. What's that going to do to our mental health? How is it going to feed into anxiety and not be good enough? Maybe um, one way to approach that is to consider, and uh, I don't want to get all Freudian on everyone at this late point in the evening, but consider how many of those uh, behaviours in combination with the devices we already have are themselves libidinal relations. Mm. There's a, a phrase that Mark Fisher uses about um, mobile phones, particularly about iPhones. He calls them um, uh, electro-libidinal parasites. Um, because of the way they parasitize mm. libidinal behaviors, the repeat, 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 repeat. And those behaviors in us uh, are being channeled already, mm. every day, by many things, by the world around us, by advertising, and by all the devices we use. So perhaps we're already in that world, and this is mm. maybe about redirecting mm. it towards a more proper, full, rather than partial object. Mm. Or not. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh. oh no, I was just going to say, in terms of technology today, the, the, the phone is a good example. Phones, our mm. phones are very intimate to us. We don't tend to lend our phones to strangers. We have this attachment to our technology already mm. that we don't want to, we don't want to share it. We keep it to ourselves. Mm. And I mean, I, I, we feel slightly freaked out by the idea of giving a stranger my phone. Mm. Uh, you just don't do it. Even if they were standing there going, I really need to call someone, you'd be, oh, I don't know, and I want to pass that over to you. So there is this attachment already to, to technology that we have. And our last question, just here. Thank you very much. Um, so the question is that most technology seems to either do a new thing that doesn't, isn't already provided, um, or do something much, much better than something that already existed. And technology that doesn't do one of those things tends to not be very successful. For example, the Apple Watch, given that we have smartphones and watches. So my question is, <laughs> and smartphones have clocks on them. Um, what is the incentive for businesses who primarily have to mass produce these things? Because a lot of the, the sector robots we've talked about have been produced as sort of R&D stuff, not necessarily to be sold, or reduced as sort of university pieces or thought research, which ultimately cannot be produced in the mass sphere. What is the actual financial incentive to produce sex robots on a mass scale that might actually be mass produced by individuals, given that all the examples we've had so far have been very niche people, with very niche sexual preferences, who probably could not provide the huge amount of capital necessary to create a kind of artificial intelligence sex robot, given that we have things like sex toys. Um, what is the quantifiable like, improvement we get with our kind of like number six from Battlestar Galactica, <coughs> given the decades of R&D that we necessary to build that thing? 
and a few number of people who would want product. Why would actually reduce that to a so who's going to build yeah. the internet genitalia, Ian? Yes. <laughs> well, I, I, I think you will have a very small market of people who are prepared to go out and buy just a sex robot. Uh, the vast majority of people will go out and buy a robot that does other things, like cleaning the house or being a home butler or whatever. And, and then people will form relationships with those. I mean, we know people, you know, just watching uh, Star Wars and other, other science fiction, people do form relationships with, you know, pretty crude robots. As long as they've got some sort of a personality there, you'll form an attachment with it. And um, people will buy all sorts of domestic robots for all sorts of reasons, and a lot of that will be for companionship. And those companionship robots will look quite human-like in many cases, and people will have sex with them. A few people will buy their robots specifically for sex, but they're going to be quite expensive to do that, I think, initially. So I don't think that market will be the dominant one. I think it will come in via the back door. Why would you want to have sex with your serving room model when it probably wouldn't be very good because it hasn't been designed to have sex with you? Well, I, I do like C3PO. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Because like lots of it presumes lots of vacuum of like just C3PO or no sex with me. I could have sex with a person, I could use a sex toy, but lots of other opportunities that probably be much better than having sex with, let's say C3PO. Yeah. Why there's the incentive to make C three PO better at having sex than say create great on it? Yeah. The, the, the key thing there is that technology doesn't happen in a vacuum. It doesn't come in overnight and suddenly you've got a, a robot in your house. It's, 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 it's not like that. It develops over a period of years. And during those years, you're messing around with virtual reality. You're learning to have virtual sex with all sorts of other people. You're starting to use uh, uh, machine mediation of that sex. You're starting to make all sorts of different things, which make it more likely that when you come to buy your domestic robot, you will also buy one that's attractive and probably has that sex function built into it. If you're doing it tomorrow, you probably wouldn't. But if you're buying it in 10, 15 years' time, you probably would. But it's really hard to have sex that's good. Like, like. So I, <laughs> so Gareth, Gareth, and I know you. This is not, this is not therapy. Um, <laughs> I don't mean, like having sex just like just like just rotting into something. Like it has to like, react back to you because you're already calling programming But 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 it will. I mean, the robot that's that you would. Yeah, if, 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 if you're having sex with an AI that exists today in 2015, it's not going to be very good. If you're having sex with an AI. Um, which happens to be using a robot. I mean, it's a separate the AI and the robots because they're not quite the same thing. But your AI that you're having sex with via the robot, you will get to know that. You will have a very, very close relationship with that AI by the time you get around to having sex with it. And the robot is, is just a front-end device. You know, it's like no, a, there is like movement that you quite have sex. Yeah. You, look, you look horrified. Yeah, I was just going to say sex toys. I mean, um, start with sex toys, lots of people on sex toys. Would you want one that gets better and better and learns more and more about you? The sex gets better and better with the sex toy? Yes, sure, why not? I mean, I would, but you know. Um, how far you want, do you want to take that? In that, that I see as an area for marketization. And um, mm -hmm. you know, if someone had said to me 10 years ago, would you want a, a phone that you were intimately linked to and that could do everything for you? I'd, I'd laugh and say, well, I don't want a phone that I'm that dependent on, but now I have one and, you know, I love mm -hmm. it to bits, emotionally attached. Um, same with sex toys. Why not go down that route? And I can't resist giving the last question to Ghislaine Boddington, who is... His action was a general comment, but it was a fantastic panel, really great. But I just wanted to say that I think that um, coming back to the ethics and behaviours question, which I think is really important, and everybody knows that that's a deep importance in it all. Um, we're, what, we are all aware of the sci-fi connections, but also we need to be aware how mass those are. But actually, I mean, for example, we haven't mentioned, but Humans, the recent series on television, Her, mm. the film, that these are mass discussions mm -hmm. about the ethics and behaviours around all of this, which happen long before these things come about. So uh, maybe we have to stay a bit optimistic. To, I mean, I had an incredible discussion in a taxi recently about humans with the taxi driver. This is happening everywhere. In everyone's homes, it's not, luckily, it's not just in here, yeah, even though this is a deeper debate and with much more knowledge and expertise. So, so maybe we have to believe that these debates will go deeper through the mass um, media expo exposure that's happening to where we explore those dystopias through those films and hopefully utopics that come out. Mm. Well, I would hope so. And let me end with this. The
future is always virtual and many things that may seem imminent never actually happen. Fortunately, our ability to survive the future is not contingent on our capacity for prediction, though sometimes on those much more rare occasions, something remarkable comes of staring the future deep in the eyes and challenging everything that it seems to promise. I hope you feel you've done that tonight. The bar is open. Please join me in thanking these wonderful panelists.